Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Samuel Horvitz, if you've heard of him, he was a very successful businessman. He died in 1956, divided up his various companies among his three sons. Uh, the mom was still alive for a while. When she died in 1977, then there was all of this undercurrent of hostility among the sons. And they started having lawsuits against each other for a decade, almost a decade. They had 17 lawsuits suing each other, uh, or fighting over the, uh, the properties. He had uh, vast holdings, uh, land equipment, real estate down in uh, uh, a Florida, a television, a radio station, all kinds of stuff. And after 10 years of fighting, the probate judge finally uh, had them just sell off all the assets. It came to uh, $750 million and they gave it, uh, awarded it to the sons and then, their, and then the grandkids. And, and even after that, though, all that money, they still would not talk to each other. There was so much hostility there. They've been estranged, not just over... Um, uh, just over the money and how it was divided, but emotional wounds and other kinds of things. And it's half century later almost. It's still going on. Family businesses employ about 60% of the workforce. They generate about 40% of the gross national project product. Experts say that family businesses rarely transfer down uh, to the next generation. Only about a third of the family businesses make the transition from the founder to the second generation. And of those, only a third make it from the second generation to the third generation. Uh, one business professor said the attrition rate among family businesses is like a war. Over a period of time, no one survives. Probably one of the saddest examples of conflict around a person's estate is that of Martin Luther King Jr. The kids have been squabbling for years over King's estate. Uh, not that long ago, they sued over uh, a book deal regarding their mother. And most recently, currently, Dexter is suing Bernice over the ownership of their father's Bible. And unfortunately, because of Dr. King's untimely death, he was unable to pass on his reconciling spirit to his, to his kids. Now, as you read about different lawsuits, modern-day lawsuits uh, with kids and, their, and, and, and uh, fighting over the states, often it's not uh, who's going to be the next CEO. Often it's not like who, how much money you're going to get, but it's deep-seated back from when they were kids. It's like goes back to like middle school, like, you know, like the older brother got the bigger piece of pie. Or when we moved, uh, who got the, the largest bedroom? Or who got to work at dad's company uh, when they were in middle school? And it goes way back to these deep-seated things that festers over time and then explodes. Now, we are looking at the patriarchs and have been, and this is our final week here in family mess, or families are messy, and We've been looking at dads who are certainly imperfect, and yet God uses them. Today we're going to be looking at Jacob. Jacob was a dad of 12 sons, but he also had a father-in-law who they had uh, a problem. There was, there was conflict. There was conflict in that family. And we're going to kind of look at that, unpack that a little bit today, and look at, hey, how can it help us become better in our relationships, particularly 
in our family conflicts. And there's a lot we can learn from them. Now, let me ask you, have you ever been in a miserable job? A job you you say, I can't stand it. Well, Patrick Lencioni has written a number of books on work and the marketplace and leadership. One of his good books is called Three Signs of a Miserable Job. And here's what he says. The three signs are number one is anonymity. Number two is irrelevance. Number three is immeasurement. Anonymity, in other words, nobody knows you're around. Nobody really cares. If you don't show up, it's no big deal. And everybody needs to know that their job uh, has value, especially to uh, somebody in authority, that it's appreciated, your unique qualities. Second is that your job matters to somebody, that you're making a difference in somebody else's life because of the effort that you're putting in. And that, that's, that's relevant. It makes a difference. And then thirdly, every employee needs to be able to gauge their progress. They, be, they need to know, how am I doing? Am I doing a good job? Am I doing a bad job? And they can mark progress. These are the three things that make up uh, the, making a job worthwhile and that you're not miserable. Well, Jacob didn't have these. Jacob had a very miserable experience in his work relationship with his father-in-law, Laban. And so we look, and, and, and one of the things is because of Laban, in this story we see Laban had despi- despicable treatment. He treated Jacob horribly. Jacob had been living in Padam Aram, which is where Laban is, and he's modern-day Iraq, for 20 years. His father-in-law uh, had hired him, employed him, but had treated him terribly, tricked him, and, uh, ab- and, and used him. During that time, he was, as, as Jacob says, he was treated like a slave. Three times in Genesis 30, he uses the word slave. It may be translated to different, in different translations, but he basically says, I slave for you. And sometimes the translations say, I work for you or I served in your house. But that word is often used in other times in the Bible. Is, I, I felt like an indentured s- servant. I'm, I was a slave. And he describes the working conditions later on, kind of looking back, and this is where we start in Genesis 31. There, and beginning in verse 39, he says, I, J- Jacob speaking, he's reflecting on his work environment. He says, I did not bring any animals torn by wild beasts because his job was, he, he was a shepherd. He had to oversee animals. I bore the loss myself. And you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me by the daytime and the cold at night and sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for 20 years. I've been, I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks and you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father and the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you surely would have sent me away empty handed. So he says, hey, this is a terrible situation. He's living paycheck by paycheck. He has no way out. He's trapped, and he's being treated like dirt. He's going, that's a miserable job, right? Would you agree? That's that's an explanation of it. Here, I'm being treated terribly. And Jacob did not care that this was his son-in-law. He was just using him and abusing him. And it goes on to make his... Uh, the, the job even worse, Labor, Laban is a deceiver. He deceives, it. He, he's full of deception. Laban has become wealthy at Jacob's expense. And a lot of it was through deception. Uh, Jacob wanted to marry one of Laban's daughter. He says, I will work for seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. He's all excited. Seven years is a large payment, even in those days, a, a large bride pay, pay, price, but he's willing to do it. He works seven years and he gets tricked he ends up getting the older sister, Leah, and he goes, okay, I'll make it work if you work another seven years. So he tricks him, really becomes quite wealthy off of his deception over Jacob. So Jacob, after 14 years, decides, I'm done. This thing is terrible. I'm quitting. And he goes to Laban, his father-in-law, and he says, I- I'm going to quit. It's over. But his father-in-law says, he realizes this guy makes him a lot of money. So he goes, hey, listen, I want you to stay. What will it take? Name your price. So he does this common business tactic of not offering a certain price. He says, 
you start, you know, like he's real magnanimous. He just goes, you start. And here's what Jacob does. He goes, I don't, I've tried that money thing. You just keep lowering my wages. He goes, uh, he goes, uh, I'm going to go for stock options. Jacob replied, he says, but if you will do this one thing for me, I will go on tending your flock and watching over them. Let me go through all your flocks today and room, remove them from every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark colored lamb and every spotted and, and speckled goat. They will be my wages and my honesty will testify for me in the future whenever you check on the wages you have paid me. Any goat in my possession that is not speckled or spotted, any lamb that is not dark colored will be considered stolen. And he goes, hey, listen, if uh, we're going to separate these out, if you find any that belong to you, consider stolen. Not only will I return it to you, but there will be uh, compensation and fees associated with it. Jacob hears this. He goes, agreed. Good, good deal for him. He says, let it be as you have said. That same day, he, referring to Laban, removed all the male goats. Of course, that wasn't part of the deal. It was Jacob who was supposed to do that. And they were streaked and spotted, and all the speckled and spotted female goats, all that had white on them, and all the dark-colored lambs. Lambs, sheep, are generally white. It's rare that you would have a dark-colored or a, a, a black sheep. And he placed them in care of his sons. This is Laban's sons. Laban then gives watch to just the few amount, because there's way less, to his own kid, his own sons. To Jacob, he says, I want you to watch the bulk of the flock, which is his own. He goes, then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob, while Jacob continued to watch the rest of Laban's flocks. So this is the deal that, that Jacob proposes. It's Jacob's idea. He comes up, he goes, hey, listen, I, let's, we, I'm not going to do the money. I want stock in the company. And so I want... Uh, the sheep and the goats that are speckled, spotted, and streaked, which is rare. There's not as many of them. They, uh, when a sheep gives birth or a goat, it's only about every three or four. And then when Jacob hears that they're even going to be separated, genetics works in his favor. He's thinking, oh, it'll even be less frequent. So Jacob will remain poor, and I will just get richer, and he's totally okay with that. So 14 years Laban deceives him, and now it looks like he's going to get another chance. And this isn't just the, this isn't the only deception. There's other deceptions that went on. He changed his wages, uh, lowered it is what he meant there, meager wages, and he keeps lowering it. Your father's cheated me by changing my wages 10 times, he says. And then Leah and Rachel even say that he is a thief, that, they were get, that Jacob had paid a dowry to them. And he says not only he has sold us, but he has used up what was paid for us. And so in other words, he cut him out of the will, the inheritance is gone, and he spent up any kind of dowry that was given and, uh, and, did, and used it on himself. So he certainly has integrity problems, character issues. He's not the boss of your dreams, wasn't the boss of Jacob's dreams. And this is family conflict at its best. I mean, here it is, his family conflict, they're related and, and he's treating them terribly. Now, it's interesting, even in family conflict, you still see the finger of God moving through it, and you see that there, Jacob, Laban still has this measure of discernment about what God is doing through his son-in-law. Laban realizes it's Jacob, Laban's discernment. Laban realizes that he's being blessed because of Jacob. Now, notice this in, in Genesis 30, verse 27. But Laban said to him, referring to Jacob, I have found favor in your eyes, please stay. If I have found favor in your eyes, please stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. He says, you're the reason I'm being blessed, and I get that. He's not making this up. This is a, this is a level of discernment that he has. Jacob says the same thing a couple of verses later. Jacob said to him, you know I have worked for you and how your livestock have fared under my care. In other words, it's obvious. It's not even disputable. The little you had before I came has increased greatly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I have been. But now, when may I do something for my own household? So all of the great things that have happened, it's only prospered Laban. Laban gets that. And then Jacob says, in this, or the Bible says, and in this way the man grew exceedingly prosperous, referring to Jacob, and came to own large flocks and male and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. As you know, every Christian has an influence in their workplace, in their family, at school, in their places, in their neighborhood, in their places of influence. They have uh, an influence that 
if you're a Christ follower, is above your own natural abilities. It, it's, it's like a God-given ability to bless people. You, if you've surrendered your life to Christ and you say yes to the Lord, you have a God-given ability to be a blessing to other people above your own ability. Now, you might not even be aware of that. Often people are not. Because we have our own abilities that God kind of, we were born with. We, they came, we came into this world with certain temperaments and we have our environment and the way uh, the influence of our parents and genetics. There's a number of things that go in to who we are. But then on top of that, that's kind of the natural part of us, but then there's a supernatural part of us that we're able to influence people above and beyond what we could in our own, in our own natural ability. And so if you were to talk to somebody who's like has uh, a, this a God-given ability, we might call it anointing or spiritual gift, has this anointing to uh, be an encourager. When you're around them, you just feel better. You feel like the future is a little brighter, that you have hope in your life, that you feel better about today, better about yourself. And if you tell them, man, you just, you're quite an encourager. God uses you to encourage people. If you were to say that to that person, they might not even be aware of it. They might go, well, yeah, I, I like to encourage. I mean, I do like to you know, see people do, have their attitudes lifted up. And they might not even make the connection that that's God at work in their life. Often they don't. And sometimes it's very, very hard to separate those. What part is me and then what part is where God is doing his work and through me? But God does do that through spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. And there's an anointing on people to lead there's an anointing on people to teach. Some people, they, they teach, and there's a spiritual power. You just, if you were just to tran make a transcription of their message, you go, you know, or what they said, it, what's this? You know, but yet there's an anointing where lives are changed because of it. There's an anointing sometimes on people who give, and they have like this, this gift of giving. Some people have a, 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 an anointing to, to uh, help people and, and, and to and to care for people that are, that are on the fringes of society. There's all kinds of spiritual gifts. And God uses those. So J J Jacob has this. He has this gift, what he puts his hand to. God blesses it. And the watching world, which is Laban, there's Labans in the world, they look and they go, hey, God, God's using you in a powerful way. And he recognizes it. He recognizes the supernatural ability he has. Now listen, you have that. Dads, you have an anointing to be an influence on your kids. You may not be aware of that. If you're not, and, and you have specific gifts, not just this, you know, general, you know, anointing. Well, that's cool, you know. No, it's a, it's a specific gift. We talk about the gifts and the growth track, and we talk about gifts in other places, but the Bible, listen, in 1 Corinthians 12 and, and uh, Ephesians 4, there's a number of places where it just talks about there's specific gifts. If you're not sure what your gift is, you sh I encourage you to pray about it. Say, God, show me the gift. That, not just what I, my natural abilities, but your supernatural gifts that are operating in my life. Pray about that. Encourage somebody else. Say, would you pray for me? Help me, and then ask people, and then ask them to pray for you. Say, do you see, what do you see? What kind of spiritual gift? What kind of an anointing? And then you start to be able to move in that and express that and bless people around you. Bless your children. Bless your parents and your siblings and your family and beyond. You be a blessing. Use the God-giving uh, anointing to be a blessing to other people. It's a very powerful thing when you tap into that. So here, Jacob 20 years, he's been in a tough spot. Certainly God is using him, but as far as we know, he has not heard from God in 20 years. 14 years, certainly. You know, when he, when he was coming, he heard God speak to him, and now it's been, he's been in this dry place, this difficult place. How does God heal our family mess? Well, on the back of your outline, first, we have to realize God never rushes. God is never in a hurry. We are in her, a hurry all the time, especially in our society. We're very impatient. I mean, if, we're, if our computer takes too long to, to, to start up, we're like, oh, come on. You know, we're trying to, 
we're surfing and a page downloads too slowly. <laughs> They're lost. I'm not waiting. I mean, we're just, we're so, we're, we're impatient, right? We're, we're impatient. And we often project that onto God like he's in a hurry, like we're in a hurry. But God is not in a hurry. Richard Muau, the uh, professor of faith and public life at Fuller Seminary, said that most Americans believe in an impatient God who works very abrupt, very decisive, and in very clear ways. And therefore, they miss the activity of God. Those people will say, you know, I've been praying for my kids, and God is not moving. God, and, and, and why? Because in your time frame, how do you know God's not moving? See, we, our measurement is some, so small sometimes, it looks like God's not moving. But the truth is, God is not in a hurry. He's, not, he's often doing multiple things at once. He's like the ultimate multitasker. He's, cha he's, he's, he's changing us. He's about, you know, we're, we're changing because of it. Other people, not just one person, we're just praying for one person, but maybe he's building a testimony. There's so many of things that go on when God is at work. Now, it can be confusing because we do see God moving instantaneously sometimes. Sometimes we'll write on a particular day like today. Uh, in, in a few minutes, I'll give an opportunity to receive Christ. We have people every weekend receive Christ. And, and today, your life can be changed. Boom. Instantaneously, you walk away, and God often re just removes certain temptations or addictions out of people's lives. Power encounter comes in. It's instantaneous. And we go, wow, I like that. Or somebody comes forward and gets prayer and they get healed, physical healing they might have had for years, and instantly it's healed. Or emotional healing, relational healing, all of a sudden people are reconciled and, and, and something that they've been at counseling for years and God does something and all of a sudden there's reconciliation. So it does happen instantaneous, but here, this is not the norm. When you look in Scripture, you do not see that God does instantaneous healing, but that's not the norm. The norm is God is not in a hurry. The norm is, is Abraham has a promise that he's going to have a son and he waits 25 years until he gets that kid. 25 years. Or you have Jacob waiting 20 years. He had a promise that he wouldn't be left in this other foreign land. He would come back to the promised land in 20 years. Joseph is 13 years in, in slavery in Egypt and in prison before he becomes the governor of Egypt. You have these long, long durations. Moses, 40 years on the other side of the desert with his father-in-law, just herding sheep, waiting for God to raise him up to deliver the people from bondage in Egypt. 40 years. This is more the norm, that God is not in a rush. We are, and then when we get in a rush, we miss what God's doing. Peter says, God isn't late with his promise as some measure lateness. He is restraining himself on account of you, holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's giving everyone space and time to change. The Mennonites have a saying that says, we are now living in the time of God's patience. He is patient. He's not in a hurry. He's waiting on us. He's waiting on the unsaved to repent. He's waiting on the saved to to learn greater levels of obedience. God is waiting, and he's patient for us, and he's waiting for us. God never rushes, and he always remembers. God always remembers. Re many years before this, as he was leaving the promised land, as I said, he stopped at a place where he, Jacob made a monument. He laid down and had a dream, and, uh, and, uh, on, he, his head was on this rock. He had this dream of this ladder reaching up to heaven. Angels were ascending and descending. God comes and he speaks. He says, hey, you're, you're going to Padamaram. It's going to be a while you're there, but you will not be forgotten. He says, you'll come back. You'll be part of the promised land. You'll, you, your inheritance is here. He goes, so no matter what happens, you know, I'm not going to forget you. And he goes, I am the God, and he names this place, I am the God of Bethel. I'm the God of Bethel. Now, only Jacob and God knew about this. And then years later, he has another encounter with God. 14 years later, he has this other encounter, and he's describing it to Rachel and Leah, saying, this is what happened to me. 
He says, in breeding season, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw that the male goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled, and spotted. So God is the one who gave him this idea. So when he was talking to Laban about it, it sounded like his, his own plan, which Laban thought, that sounds dumb. But Jacob goes, no, no, this is God's plan for me. And he goes, the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. And he said, look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled, and spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. Kind of like what God said to Moses when he said, I've seen what the Egyptians, slave owners have been doing to you, how they've been mistreating you. I'm going to bring deliverance. He's, he's the same kind of things happening here. He goes, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, this is the rock that he slept on, and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. Now at once for Jacob, is this is 14 years past, not 20, it means he has another six years. But at once for Jacob meant he was to go and tell his father-in-law, I'm quitting, we have a new plan, it's a new day. At once for Jacob meant that he had to get started on this new investment strategy for his own life. At once for Jacob meant that he had to get moving on the plan God was going to, was executing in his life today, even though he wouldn't actually be delivered for six more years. You see, when God calls you to do something, at once for you might mean that you have to go back to school. You, you say, God, I want a new job. Okay, well, it's going to happen. Go back to school at once. God, I want to get married. Okay, well, you need to be delivered from your addiction to porn at once so that I can prepare your heart for the dream girl I have for you, not some warped dream some other guy has for you. And God, I have a, this dream to have a different financial picture. Okay, well then start getting debt free today at once. So for Jacob, at once meant he needed to start now. He needed to start now. And God's plan for him goes against common sense and conventional wisdom, to be sure. Jacob implements this plan, and here's how it goes. Notice, Jacob, however, took fresh-cut branches from poplar, almond, and plane trees, that's sycamore trees, and made white strips on them by peeling the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches, and they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted. Jacob set apart the young of the flock by themselves, but made the rest face the streaked and dark-colored animals that, lay, that belonged to Laban. Thus he made separate flocks for himself and did not put them with Laban's animals." Whenever the stronger females were in heat, Jacob would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so they would mate near the branches. But if the animals were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban and the strong animals to Jacob. In this way, the man, this is Jacob, grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. I love that, or he calls him the man. If you want to be the man, <laughs> you, you, you got to have some kind of investment strategy. This is what Jacob does. He says, you know what, I need to have, I need to plan some things out. I need to have some short-term plans, long-term plans. And he actually comes up with this plan uh, with God's guidance, and it really is a financial portfolio that entails three different levels of diversification. That the first level is very, very low yield, but low risk. He knows he's going to get these spotted, speckled, and, uh, and, and streaked animals. And, and so he's got some, and they will mate. Now, unfortunately, as, as, uh, as I said earlier, they only, they'll still, even streaked, spotted, and speckled will still have uh, one-colored animals. And uh, so by separating, that helps a little bit. That gives him a little bit of a genetic advantage for that part of his investment. Uh, but... It's still very, very uh, low. Then he has a more, uh, a more aggressive investment, and that's where he is the shepherd in charge. And so he makes sure, and he mates the strong animals that are going to go to him. The weak ones will go to Laban. And any breeder knows that. They get the pick of the litter. They go, this is the one that I'm going to use for breeding. I'm not going to use the weaker ones, the run of the litter. No, those I'm going to sell. If it's a livestock, those are the ones I'll sell or butcher. But it's 
it's, uh, it's the strong one. So this is his more aggressive plan. Then he's got a third level, which is a high-risk venture. I mean, it is really just a vision and a prayer, literally. A vision and a prayer. God gave him this vision, and he's going, it doesn't even make any common sense. He knows if he sits down with a financial planner, they'll go, that's stupid, that won't work. But he, he, he moves on. He goes, okay, this is part of my plan as well because he wants to be freed in six years. That's pretty quick. He wants to be prosperous in six years. So he goes, I'm going to have this other thing that if it works out, it's going to be extremely prosperous for me. But it doesn't make sense. It involves him taking these pieces of wood, which is uh, the, uh, you know, this sycamore tree, the plane tree, the almond tree, and he takes the poplar tree and he strips the bark off in strips, then puts the, the pieces of wood, the branches, in the watering troughs where the animals are going to, to drink the water. And then, voila, they're going to have speckled and spotted uh, younglings, you know, progeny. Now, is that even possible? I mean, is it possible just to have wood, animals look at wood, and your genetic makeup changes? Well, actually, yes. And even though this story is 4,000 years old, we only understand it now in the last nine years of, of uh, the genetics and how it works. You see, uh, there is a way that, that we have, uh, we've understood that the, gen the genome, the DNA sequence, is set. What you were born with, it's set and cannot be changed. However, there's uh, environmental circumstances ca that can cause chemical reactions that, that will uh, make your DNA kind of change a little bit, not change, it, it kind of rolls around the RNA and the way it interacts so that it can actually have like a genetic impact without changing your genetic sequence. That's why they call it epigenetics. And it overlays on it. And it overlays it so profoundly that it actually goes and continues on from progeny to progeny. And so in this case, you have uh, specific trees, poplar, almond, and plain. These trees in particular have a bark that underneath it has a fungus, a fungi that when, you, that when you pull it out, it actually has these free radicals that, uh, that get, would, in this case, when he puts it in the water, these free radicals, which are uh, methanine and choline, that when the animal drinks it, it actually darkens their fur. If you look at, at individual hairs, you actually see streaked parts where it's light and dark which would have been the streaked, the spotted, speckled look of these animals. And so the lambs there, they're white, they're drinking, the sheep are white, they're drinking this, uh, this, this, this uh, water that's filled with these amino acids that causes them to actually change. Now, he wouldn't have known that, right? There's no way, but he knew God was up to something. He goes, you know, I'm gonna trust God. It doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't have made sense to geneticists 10 years ago. Yet he trusts God, and God moves on him. Now, why does God do this elaborate plan? It's for one reason. He says, I remember you, Jacob. You matter to me. I'm not going to leave you hanging. When I made that promise years ago, I care about you. You have a future and a hope in, in, my, in, in what I'm doing. And this is what it was all about. Not to just make Jacob wealthy. Sure, that's a nice side thing. Yeah, I'm wealthy now. But what was way more important was that God saying, you matter. I remember you. I'm not in a hurry, but I do remember you. I'm not going to forget you. And so this is the message that happens to Jacob. And then thirdly, thirdly, God regularly restores. God restores. He heals family conflict. You see, Jacob ends up taking his wives, his kids, and all of his livestock, everything that he owns, and he, and he leaves. He doesn't tell Laban he's doing that because he's afraid what Laban will do. And he gets three days out. Laban finds out he's steaming mad. He gets his relatives. 
He gets on, they get on their horses. They chase him down, chase Jacob down. It takes them seven days to catch up to him. And he's going to hurt him. He's already screaming, this is what I'm going to do to this guy, man. I can't wait to get my hands on him. But the night before he shows up and catches Jacob, God speaks to Laban and says, hey, listen, don't say anything bad or good to, J to Jacob. Leave him alone. And so it ta that tempers him. He gets there. He's still upset. He still fumes. But he, he pulls way back. Jacob then starts to share. For the first time, he's been there 20 years, and he never really shared how he felt. And he starts to explain that. These, and, the, and we see some things that help us in family healing. Number one, we verbalize the hurt. This is the first time these guys are doing that. Laban's sharing, hey, this is how I felt. But particularly Jacob. The, we, those verses we started out with this morning that where he lists, hey, this is how I've been treated. He needed to say that way, way earlier on. But he verbalizes his hurt. He says, this is, you know, just spilling the beans. Stop avoiding the elephant in the room. You talk about it. And if you have family conflict, I'm not talking about, for, you know, you're frustrated with somebody in the last week or two or a month. I'm not about for years. You need, to, you need to go verbalize it. You might need to talk to them, uh, write a letter, preferably maybe uh, see them if it's Zoom or through Skype or whatever. Jacob chose to do it face-to-face. -face. Conflict is always handled best face-to-face, -face, but this is what he does. And he talks to him. And, uh, of course, Jacob says, listen, I made you wealthy. And I worked my butt off, and you prospered, and you treated me like dirt. Laban, of course, has a different view. He goes, hey, everything you had is mine. It was all mine anyway, so anything you did for me is mine, and so I owe you nothing. So often you don't, you don't get a meeting of the minds, but at least they verbalize their hurt. Number two, we, reserve, we resolve to stop hurting each other. So they realize they wouldn't be on the same page because they had two different views of history. But they also said, you know what, let's stop the hurt. Let's just stop it here. So they, they made a covenant between each other. They set up some healthy boundaries. They said, okay, listen, uh, this is the place where you stay, and this is the place where I'll stay, because we're going to stop this thing where we continue to hurt each other. Now, the third step they never got to, and that's walk around in each other's shoes. This is so important because it really helps you to understand where another person's coming from. When I was in middle school, I read a book called Black Like Me. It was written by uh, John Howard Griffin. And it was about a guy, it was written in 61, a guy in 59, a white guy colored his skin black and then traveled around in the south on buses and hitchhiking and then, and then uh, chronicled how he was treated. And it really kind of exposed some of the dark times of our country about how people of color were treated uh, uh, in that day. And, uh, and so he just walked around in their shoes, at least momentarily. Helps you to see it from a different perspective. Sharon was a waitress uh, and for a number of years, and so over the years she's tried to help me to be more sympathetic whenever there's something going on, they're not, you know, they, the food's wrong, or, hey, listen, I've been there, I know how that is. And, and I helped her to be kinder to door-to-door -door salespeople because I was one. Whenever they'd ring the doorbell, Sharon, oh, no, not another one. Listen, they have to make a living too. My son's in tech support now. And I'm, whenever I'm talking to somebody on tech support and I think, I, I get frustrated. I think, hey, this could be my son on the other line. How would I want other people to treat him? See, when we walk in somebody else's shoes, it starts to shift. Something shifts in our attitude. And then number four, and this is when you know you're really healed. We receive God's heart for the other person. See, not just intellectually, but God does something in us that couldn't be done on its own. We've had people here in our church that have been unreconciled They've for months. Some of them separated, some even divorced. That God did something in their hearts and they came back together. We've had people that have had broken relationships and hurt feelings in our church and, and, and they just through God's power of reconciling and changing somebody's heart, all of a sudden, they just have a, you know what, maybe it's not that. I can let those things go. I can, I don't have to hold on to that resentment, that bitterness. And God is in the business of healing family conflict. Amen. You don't have to stay where you're at. God wants to heal your 
your, the friction that you've got in, 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 in your family. And he can do it. He can do it. Let's bow our heads and pray. Well, Lord, we come to you right now, Lord. On this Father's Day, reflecting that none of us have perfect fathers on earth, but we certainly have a Father in heaven who loves us and cares for us. God says he cares for you. He loves you and he remembers you. And maybe you've interpreted the fact that he's not in a rush as he doesn't care about you. That he doesn't know, he hasn't heard your prayers for your kids. He hasn't heard your prayers for your, for your spouse or for your parents. But God hears every prayer. He moves on every prayer in his timing. Sometimes they're instantaneous, and I love that. I'm sure, sure you do as well. But sometimes God is in the process of doing something greater than just the thing we pray for. God says, he remembers you. He has a promise for you. You go, I don't have a promise. I didn't lay on some rock and the heavens open up, but let me tell you that God's word is filled with promises and they apply to you. God says that he says that he loves you. His promise to you is that he goes, that he has a future and a hope for you. That he walked in your shoes that's why Jesus Christ came. He rubbed shoulders with people that were on the fringes of society. People that felt like they weren't worthy. God says, he wants to change your heart. He wants to heal your family. And the beginning part of that is when you just lay it down and surrender and say, God, bring your healing. And you st let God start with you. Certainly you can verbalize your hurt. You can do some of the things we were talked about today. Those are all good things to do. But let God start with your heart. If you've never put Christ in your life, this is the moment, okay? This is what it's all about right now. You just say, dear God, I invite Jesus Christ into my life to change me. Say, Holy Spirit, come, empower me. Everyone here can say, Holy Spirit, come, renew me, renew my vision. Help me to... Use the gifts that I have to be a blessing to others. Help me to be someone with a reconciling spirit. You know, I almost, I had this picture of somebody like putting down their ax, putting down their weapon. Whatever your weapon is, social media, there's all kinds of weapons. I'm going to put that down. No more gossiping for me. No more talking about the relatives behind the other person's back. I'm putting down my weapon. Now, it's not, that applies to some of you. You need, to, if God's asking you, just put that down. Let me, and God says, I will be your defense. I will be your shield. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vmchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.